Greetings, First Christian Church Bonner Springs family and friends and guests. It is the weekend of August 8 and 9, 2020. I'm Rick Jordan. Joining me in the sanctuary are Dick and Dot Espy, Pastor Sarju Jackson, and our instrumentalist, Connie Henry. We're really glad you are with us this weekend. If you would like to try one of our Zoom Bible study groups, we're providing the link for you right here. And if you would like to give, uh, we're providing you the link to our website right here. And you can follow that link and click on uh, the next link, which is for online giving. Our scripture passage today is Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. When Jesus had finished saying all of this to the people who were listening, meaning Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus entered Capernaum. There a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. Jesus was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd following him, Jesus said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. We are disciples of Christ, a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. As part of the one body of Christ, we invite all to the table in the same way that God in Christ has welcomed us to the table. As Connie plays, let's prepare our hearts for worship. Indeed, Lord, you are Jesus of all times. And this is why we could come to you last night, early this morning, 
And right now we can come to you. Praying with faith. Please join me this morning as we pray with faith. I want you to please reach out and reach into your memories. Or if you have a prayer list before you, please pull it out. I want you to pull it out and put yourself in the place of someone this morning who needs prayers. I want you, if you are the one who is needing prayers this morning, I want you to remember that right now, right in this time, right in this place, someone is standing in your behalf. Let us pray. God, we value all the people who are standing on behalf of others today. We value all of the people who are needing prayers this very moment. God, we value your answer to our prayers. God, we come to you on behalf of people who are needing prayers this morning. We come to you not because we are the experts of communicating with you, but because we have faith in you that in our ordinary ways of communicating and asking, you are here and you are listening to us this morning. God, we bring all of the sick before you this morning. And yes, there are many people who are sick. There are those who are sick from the pandemic. And there are those who are sick from ordinary diseases that we have heard about for many, many, many years. We bring them to you this morning. We ask you this morning, God, to touch them and heal them. Come, God, and heal the sick. Loving God, we call you this morning again to come. Come for families that are hurting because of a job lost. And yes, Lord, there are many who are hurting this morning because they have lost their jobs. Yesterday, they might have gotten the last paycheck and they do not know what to do next week. But God, in faith, we say, come, come to them. They are needing you right now and right at this moment. Loving God, we call you this morning also to come. And come, Lord, to families that are struggling with decisions about sending their children to school this fall. Yes, there are families that are struggling all over the country who do not know what to do right now, whether to send their children in person or not. And Lord, for some, they have no way of making a decision because either way, it's gonna be a hard decision for them. Some of them cannot even afford to not send their children to school in person. So we pray to you this morning, God, to give them the direction, give them the um, wisdom, to make the decision that will best serve their children. Loving God, we pray to you this morning for our nation, the world. We pray for our leaders, God, as they themselves are struggling with decisions about how to help the suffering people in this country. We pray, Lord, that you help them to make better decisions, Lord, decisions that are not based upon any party ideology, but on the love for humanity. We pray, Lord, that you intervene, speak with them, and give them the wisdom to make the best decisions that will help the suffering people. God, we pray to you in faith this morning for this worship service that is taking place and worship services that are taking place all over the world. We pray, Lord, that you help your servants to lead in those worship services. Particularly this morning, we pray for Pastor Rake as he brings the word and 
everybody that is participating in the service this morning. We pray, Lord, that your spirit cover them and give them the right words to bring to your people. God, we pray that we as your servants do not stand here to serve for the sake of just being here to serve and be seen as servant. We pray that we serve from the bottom of our heart because this is what you've asked us to do, to serve and follow in your steps. We thank you so much, Jesus, for that. Lord, at this moment, I want to say thank you for everything that is happening in this community. There are some real good things happening in this community, and there are good things happening around the world. I praise you so much this morning for that. And I pray to you, Lord, that you have brought us in this place at this time because this is the right time to be here. For in everything, you are working for your own glory. We now thank you, Jesus, and we thank you for the service and bless it as we worship you. In your name we pray, amen. Have you been amazed lately? Uh, this week I watched a video of Olympic gold medal winner and swimmer Katie Ledecky. In the video, she is in the water in one end of an Olympic-sized swimming pool, and she has a full glass of chocolate milk. She puts the full glass of chocolate milk on her head, and then she swims the length of the pool without spilling a drop. And then she drinks the, the chocolate milk. I was amazed. Maybe I'm easily amazed, I don't know. But I do think that should become an official Olympic event. In the four Gospels, Jesus was described as being amazed exactly twice. Jesus was amazed when he returned to his hometown. You can read about that in Mark chapter 6. They didn't know what to make of him. Their reaction to him was, where did he get this wisdom? Where did he get the ability to work all these miracles? He's just the carpenter's son. You can almost hear them say, we changed your diapers, boy. And they refused to believe. In fact, they were offended at him. And the text actually says that Jesus was not able to do much in his hometown because of their unbelief. And it says Jesus was amazed at their unfaith. The second account is right here, Luke 7. Jesus was amazed by the faith of this Gentile Roman soldier who would not have been on anybody's faith radar. I've spent an entire week with the story of this Gentile Roman soldier who amazed Jesus, and his story has really encouraged me. You and I can be amazing to Jesus. Testing positive for faith is not nearly as hard as we think it is. So let's go back through the passage. We'll take our time. Jesus shared all these sayings with the crowd that day on the plain, P-L-A-I-N. When Jesus was finished, he went into the town of Capernaum. There, a Roman centurion had a slave he loved dearly. The slave was sick, about to die. So when the centurion heard about Jesus, he contacted some Jewish elders. The centurion sent the Jewish elders to ask Jesus to come and heal his dear slave. With great emotion and respect, the Jewish elders presented their request to Jesus. The Jewish elders said, This man is worthy of your help. It's true that he's a centurion, 
but he loves our nation. In fact, he paid for our synagogue to be built. You probably know the Jewish people at this time were a conquered people. They were an occupied people. This Roman centurion was responsible for enforcing the laws of the Roman Empire. He was also responsible for keeping the Jewish people in their place under the Roman Empire's thumb. That was his job description. He commanded 100 other soldiers, so he had plenty of clout. To the Jewish people, this Roman soldier would have been their political enemy. He was on top. This Roman centurion was entitled. He was privileged. He was in power. He could take advantage of his entitled position if he wanted to. He didn't do that. He could abuse the Jews with his power if he wanted to do that. He didn't. He could treat his slaves like property if he wanted to. He didn't do that. The passage says he had a slave he dearly loved. He wanted Jesus to come and heal his beloved slave. And so this delegation of Jewish elders came to Jesus campaigning for their political enemy, advocating why this Roman centurion deserved Jesus' intervention. That's kind of wild. The Jewish elders said the centurion loved them and built their synagogue. It wasn't the Roman centurion's job to love the Jews. It wasn't his job to underwrite their place of worship. This Roman centurion loved beyond categories. And guess what? God calls us to love beyond categories. Jesus is all about busting human categories. We're living in the middle of a revolutionary racial ethnic awakening. When it comes to justice, when it comes to equality, we're making some long, long, long overdue adjustments. But you know what? It's always easier to live in privileged categories or stereotypes and to love those who fit in the category with us and exclude the ones who don't fit in that category. It's, it's always easier to stay in our comfort zones. It's always easier to impose our entitlement onto others. It's always easier to live in the numbing denial of our privilege. It's always easier to abuse our power. That's not where God's heart is, however. A life of category-busting love dissolves condescending labels. Does that all the time. A life of category-busting love levels the playing field in affirmation that we are all children of God and we all bear God's image. This centurion had a slave. He loved dearly. He wanted Jesus to come and heal his beloved dear slave. He loved the people he was paid to keep under the empire's thumb. Can you hear the categories popping? I think he's already pretty amazing. Verse 6, so Jesus accompanied them. When they approached the centurion's home, the centurion sent out some friends to bring a message to Jesus. The message said, Lord, don't go to the trouble of coming inside. 
I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Now, we've already seen that this Roman centurion enjoyed an elevated image in the Jewish community. He kind of had it made. All he had to do was go along with what they said. All he had to do was go along with the image of him they had built up before Jesus. And politically, he was even in a position of power over Jesus. But he sends this second delegation, this time friends, this time with his own words, reversing what the Jewish elders had just told Jesus. Did you notice what he called Jesus? Lord. He said, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. This centurion valued humility a whole lot more than he valued his image. Are you familiar with the slogan, image is everything? For a lot of people, that is true. How important is image to you? How much time and energy do we, do we expend managing the way other people see us? Image management is an industry in America. You can actually pay somebody to be your image consultant if you have enough money. God calls us to value humility more than we value our image. So what does humility mean? For one thing, it means choosing to see ourselves in relation to God and living out of that image. Humility does not mean we think less of ourselves. Humility does not mean that we put ourselves down. Humility means we think about God more, which causes us to think of ourselves less. Do you see how that works? Instead of being self-centered, we are God-centered. Fifth century bishop and theologian Augustine, or Augustine, wrote these words, The way to Christ is first through humility, second through humility, third through humility. It kind of reminds me of the three laws of real estate. Have you heard those? Location, location, location. The way of Christ is humility, humility, humility. He says, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. Verse 7, that's why I sent others with my request. Just say the word from where you are. You be you. And that will be enough to heal my servant. And then he says in verse 8, I understand how authority works. Being under authority myself and having soldiers under my authority. I command to one, go, and he goes. I say to another, come, and he comes. I say to my slave, do this, and he obeys me. The Roman centurion lived in straight, clean, vertical, hierarchical lines, and he knew exactly where he was slotted. The military will do that to you. But he says, Jesus, you have the authority to do whatever you want to do from any distance. He says to Jesus, you're above me, but you're also above everybody who is above me. Guess who that would include? Caesar. And guess what the Roman Empire called their Caesars? Lord. This soldier trusted Jesus without limits. Just say the word from where you are. 
Verse 9, Jesus was deeply pleased with him and amazed when he heard this. He turned to the crowd that followed him and Jesus said, Listen, everyone, this outsider, this Roman, has more faith than I have found even among all of our Jewish people. Jesus says, this outsider demonstrates more faith than all of you insiders put together. Let's recall who Jesus was talking to. He just finished the Sermon on the Mount. That statement would have included the 12 disciples because He had already selected them. That statement would include Jesus' inner circle. Hebrews 12 calls Jesus the source of our faith and the perfecter of our faith. The centurion's capacity to trust Jesus was itself a gift from God. God the Son was blown away by what this centurion did with his God-given capacity to trust God. There's only one current TV show that Carla and I try to keep up with. It's on NBC. It's called The Voice. There are four celebrity coaches, people like Blake Shelton, John Legend, Kelly Clarkson, and they they have all of these contestants who audition. They call them the blind auditions because their chairs are turned, and when they like what they hear, they turn a chair and and they select their contestants, and so there are four teams, and then they battle it out, and in the season finale, one is chosen as the voice, the the best voice of that season. One of the wrinkles in each season happens when a contestant chooses to perform a song written and recorded by their coach. Last season, we we watched Kelly Clarkson experience a contestant singing her own song back to her, covering her own song. And Kelly Clarkson loved it and was full of compliments about what that contestant had done with Kelly Clarkson's own material. Folks, our simple faith amazes the God who gave us the capacity to trust God. I like that. It's not hard to be amazing to Jesus. Love beyond categories. Value humility more than your image. Trust Jesus without limits. Verse 10. The friends of the centurion returned home and they found the slave was healthy, having been completely healed. Okay, we don't know how far Jesus, uh, how far away Jesus was when he said the word, spoke the word, and healed this man, but it is enough to teach us that distance to us is not distance to God. God just doesn't experience distance the same way we do. Thanks to the coronavirus, distance has become our new normal way of life. It's such a surreal existence. So we wear face masks because we love one another and we want to protect one another. And we respect the six-foot social distances because we love one another and we want to protect one another. How does this passage speak to our current distancing circumstances? I mean, we've already seen that our social categories are not God's categories. We've already seen that our limitations are not God's limitations. Now we find out that God is not hampered by distance. Whether it's six feet, 60 feet, 600 miles, Have you noticed that while we cannot physically be together, God is actually bringing us closer? 
I would set that miracle alongside what happens in Luke 7. This week, I called my friend Duskin. Uh, we baptized Duskin last year. Duskin has an array of serious health issues. When I called, I was sitting in my church office and Duskin was at home, so it was a distant conversation on the phone. I guarantee you the presence of God between us was just as palpable as have been the conversations where we could actually be sitting together before the pandemic, closer than six feet apart. During this season, when we are being church and doing church from a distance, God is miraculously shaping us in ways that might not have happened otherwise. It's going to be so sweet when the virus numbers go down and stay down, when we are finally back in this room together. But let's not underestimate what God is doing while we are physically apart. Let's stay patient. Let's not limit God. The same God who healed this Roman soldier's slave from a distance is in no way restricted by our current distance. Well, there's the passage. Is this a formula? If we love beyond categories, if we value humility before image, if we trust God without limitations, abracadabra, we get whatever we want? I don't think it works like that. In fact, I confess to burying the lead a little bit. A hearty life of faith is its own reward. A hearty life of faith is its own reward. If you are in hot pursuit of a hearty life of faith, you know exactly what I mean because you're experiencing it. The kind of life exemplified by this centurion catapults us into a new level of intimacy with God and vitality with God. You and I can be amazing to Jesus. Testing positive for faith is not nearly as hard as we might think it is. My dentist is Dr. Elmer, right across the street from our church building. The last several months, my mouth has kept Dr. Elmer and his assistant very busy. There were a number of things they needed to do to improve my teeth. And you know how it works. I go in and somehow Dr. Elmer is actually able to shoot me full of Novocaine in such a way that the needle doesn't even hurt. That's kind of mystifying. And then when the numbness has set in, they go to work. Um, there are all kinds of gadgets and tools that they put in my mouth. What is my job? It's pretty simple. Lay there and stay open. Keep my mouth open. I think the life of faith is pretty similar. Stay open. God, you be you. <laughs> and we stay open no matter what. In our relationships with each other, may we love beyond categories. In our relationship with ourselves, may we value humility before image. In our relationship with God, may we trust without limitations. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for this example. God, this week as we stay engaged with this passage through the faith exercise, we offer ourselves to you just as we are. 
whatever faith we have, mixed in with whatever questions we have, whatever doubt we have. Thank you that you love us so much that you accept us exactly as we are. Thank you for loving us too much to leave us as we are. And we pray all of this in the name of the one who taught his disciples and us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As Connie plays, I invite you to prepare yourself for communion. And as is our custom, you can use whatever elements you have on hand. Please join me now, as it is our custom now, for you to use whatever you have as we participate in the Lord's uh, Supper. Uh, join me in as we gather around this table, your table, as we gather in the presence of Christ, whose table 
this is. As I've always said, or as it is written in the scripture, Jesus reminds us to do this as often as we can. And when we do this, we do this in remembrance of him. In remembrance of Jesus for me means a remembrance of service, a remembrance of love, a remembrance of care and concern for one another, just as Jesus loved. Jesus was concerned and Jesus gave us all the services that we need. This morning I have a piece of bread and a cup and whatever you have, like I said, you may join me now as we participate together. Let us pray. Our Lord and our God, we thank you for inviting us to your table. We thank you for creating a table, a table that is safe for all of us. All of us from all different walks of life. Thank you, Lord. This is a table that is so diverse because it is your table. We thank you so much for the opportunity that we can all be called your children and come around this table. Thank you for providing it. Lord, as we go home this week, or as we venture out this week, or as we stay home this week, may we remember you. Remember you and the services that you provide. Service of healing, care, love, and concern. We thank you so much, Jesus. We thank you for the service that was done this morning. We thank you for your presence in this service this morning. We pray to you now, Lord, as we are about to leave this building, that your spirit go with us and guide us throughout the week. Bless us, Jesus. Amen. Amen.